As the global economy faces enormous uncertainty, we're bringing together some of the brightest minds in finance and economics to talk about what the recovery could look like. Today, we're speaking with Jim O'Neill. He's the former chairman of Goldman Sachs Asset Management. To start out, what do you see as the current state of the global economy and how long is it going to take to recover? First of all, I don't know. Uh, and I encourage your audience to be careful about anybody that claims with too much confidence that they do. Secondly, uh, with that in mind, uh, I'm pretty sure that we've seen the worst uh, on a truly global basis. It's quite easy to say that given that uh, the last decade, 80% of global growth has come from just China and the States and China almost definitely saw the worst of their economy uh, as far back as late or mid February. Um, and of course, we're talking when the lockdowns are starting to be eased around the world. And if you look at very high frequency data, uh, a number of places are probably coming out of the absolute abyss that most of the Western world has been in in March. So I think we're on the some kind of way back. And of course, the the, the impossible question is, is it, is it going to be a famous V? Is it going to be a W? Is it an L? Is it a U? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So what would it take to get to that notorious V that, that so many economists are coming out against now? I could imagine for later this year, we could have an economic boom. Uh, I think without a vaccine, it obviously suddenly gets a lot trickier. Uh, but the other obvious thing is that we have had an enormous amount of economic stimulus uh, put into the works. Uh, which for most of the time has been to try and maintain the size of the drop into the abyss, but it all may play some impact on the way back too. But, you know, I, I wouldn't want to bet the rest of my life on it being a V-shape, but I, I wouldn't dismiss it. What's it going to take for consumer spending to return to levels that we were seeing previously before the pandemic hit? I mean, I think this, this issue about the consumer is is almost definitely ultimately the key thing. Partly because, of course, in virtually every economy, the consumer is the most important. I think it relates to the lack of this uh, confidence that if you go into a restaurant, you, you know, you might just get it. Um, so that is tricky, which is why the vaccine issue is so important. It's not entirely impossible that a lot of these emotions we're all expressing as we're stuck inside uh, our homes and, and make us think that we'll never go to these things ever again. Uh, that once we do venture out and start to see that uh, those that run restaurants and other places where we consume have got themselves in a pretty, you know, COVID-19 uh, friendly environment, but that, that we do start doing again. However, as I'm sure you've experienced, uh, and so many of us are, we are consuming a, a lot of things in a different way than we would have done before. Uh, and so it might well be that uh, once, once we have more confidence about some kind of employment uh, and the economy more broadly picking up, we might all start consuming even more uh, online than we have been doing before. How does that change the jobs that might be available in the future and the outlook for employment and, and more in the near term unemployment? People that run really successful businesses have to be thinking about something a bit more than just a, an outright obsession with maximization of profit and, and playing their own role in trying to deal with some societal challenges. I, I suspect some of the dilemmas that this crisis has shown such a huge spotlight on is going to force some of those kind of ways of rethinking. So the oddity of where we are right now is, of course, our governments uh, end up owning for the near future so much more of our business than they ever dreamt they would do. Flip side of that, it means they have a chance of shaping how some of these businesses and industries actually might reach broader societal goals going forward. And I certainly think in that regard, Things like the quality of employment uh, and how companies uh, deal with issues about income inequality or payment issues within companies. I think that might mean there'll be more focus in the next decade on the quality of employment rather than just the sheer number of people that are being employed. So companies focusing on those environmental, social governance issues 
that's going to have to be a longer term priority you 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 expect I think that that almost definitely the, the, the climate change and the environmental issues is definitely one of the things that will get more focus. Again, if you bring in another angle to it, uh, with, with the brutality of the shutdown and the apparent incidence of the infection, you know, the younger generation yet again is being penalised in essence at the expense of the older generation. And this comes on top of uh, you know, a good uh, 10 to 20 years of other trends with dramatically rising house prices all over the world, making it more and more difficult for young people. And, and at some point, it's kind of payback time for younger people. And of course, what is it that young people seem to care about quite understandably so much compared to older people? And it's the environment and climate change. And so I think uh, for elected politicians, uh, or, or all politicians that are trying to think about what they are supposed to be doing, there is going to be probably huge political appeal of trying to think more about these things in terms of trying to guide and uh, encourage business that is more responsive about these kind of issues. But will businesses be able to afford those types of you know, investments given how cash strapped they are already in the current situation? It does give governments a pretty unique position uh, to take, for example, the airline industry. That if if you're in a country like the one where where I you know where I'm from, the UK, and you you have a a, a declared intention of net zero carbon emissions by 2030, um, and and beforehand you think, well, how am I going to be able to influence the airline industry and the auto industry? Right now. The British-based airline industry has no future unless government gives it support. Is there a risk that governments are too involved in those private companies, that there's inefficiencies? You know, that would be certainly the trade-off that others would point to. Is, is that a concern? I certainly think if you have the government and government employees doing it directly, then the likelihood of wasted money and inefficient decisions would be very, very high. And, and sort of take us back to the 1960s of the US and the UK. But I wouldn't be surprised if these kind of things did emerge. But it will be tricky for the states, that's for sure. Do you think companies are going to be more hesitant to set up business in China after the pandemic based on these tensions that we're seeing? Um, it's very fashionable to say that. Um, but it depends what kind of companies they are. At, at the end of the day, and, and in this uh context, let me emphasize how dubious I am about this such widely banded phrase, deglobalization. You know, globalization has had so many different uh, eras and phases um, where globalization evolves or is dominated by one theme or another. But the thing that commonly unites them all, it, it bases, bases itself around the role of the consumer. And so long as individuals want to consume and find the best things that they want at the most affordable prices, essentially that's what drives globalization. And if, if China does manage to recover itself and its own consumer starts to pick up more, the Chinese consumer is the single biggest global game in town and it certainly has been for the past five years. And I can't imagine, whatever our politicians say, that the world's greatest consumer companies are going to want to miss out on that. Where I do think it is very likely that there will be change is that a lot of companies that use uh, supply chains around the world to feed back into their own consumers will, will be very wary of having too much of it in China in the future. Do you think countries like the US will try to move supply chains back to the US? There's a difference between the rhetoric that comes out of the US president's mouth and what will happen. I mean, at the end of the day, and without wanting to get too, too much like an economist about it, if you're a country with very low domestic savings, what, what always happens, or usually, is that that means you have a surplus of capital coming in, which means, by definition, you have a deficit in the current account, which typically means you import more than you export. So unless the US is suddenly going to start saving a lot more, it will need capital from overseas, which means it's going to import more than it exports. And yes, they can stop importing from China, 
But unless the savings rate goes up, it will simply mean that they end up importing from a lot of other places. And it's great rhetoric, of course, or certainly worked in 2016, to say that you're going to bring all this stuff back to the heartlands of America. But without a defined policy to deliberately raise domestic savings, it isn't going to work. Could China's economy continue to grow to a pace that it does eventually exceed the U.S.? You know, is on track to become the world's biggest economy. Will we get back there and, and how long do you think that could take? I still think it's pretty likely that sometime in the next decade, China will become bigger than the U.S. But I have to say, uh, there was a couple of things that were giving me doubts before COVID-19. Uh, and this, this is definitely an enormous test. And the only way that China will get to uh, the position of, of overtaking the US, in my view, is indeed if their consumer not only recovers, but then uh, increasingly becomes a, a bigger and bigger share of their own economy. And, and, and there's two reasons why I say that. One is because I think what is clear from the politics of this mess is that China's historic role of being such a big, low value added exporter is past us. And secondly, more importantly, uh, there's been uh, an enormous number of Chinese middle classes created the past 15 years or so, maybe over 300 million. And the whole sort of bargain between Chinese people and their governments sort of links to that. And if the Chinese can't sustain more that increase in the consumer, then ultimately I think there will be political uh, uh, uncertainties and, and possible instability in China and then there will be a whole uh, new future that is not one that I would really have thought about in the past. So I think that my best guess is that, yes, China will still become the biggest economy in the world within the next decade, but it, it's not risk-free, that's for sure.